Hey, what's going on? It's Joey Myers from the Hitting Performance Lab, and in this video, we are going to talk about the dead simple strategy or guide to optimizing a hitter's timing in games. This all comes from a very simple general question of from one of my readers, how to improve my son's timing. So I know that's a very broad thing, but we're going to go into really the specifics. And this all came out of actually Colonel Mark Coast and his two boys that came up to see me about a year ago from San Diego, which is about a seven, six to seven hour drive. And we talked about some things. And then a year later, Colonel Mark would give me an update on his son, both sons and how they were doing and an adjustment that they made. And this was pretty tactical. There's some tactical stuff in this video, but there's also some theory stuff too that kind of goes along the lines of fitness and, and adaptation training and things like that or the, the principle of the rule of specificity where the body or the mind will adapt to the forces or the stresses that are put on it. So we'll go over a few different things. We're going to talk about the, the required amount of swings during the swing round in, in training and practice, so that, that making sure that we're practicing like we're going to play so that we play like we practice. We're going to talk about swing intensity. We're going to talk about which I, what I've also brought up in other videos, the hitting outcome evaluation checklist. We're going to talk about feedback, giving feedback to hitters, and about mis talk about mistakes and making mistakes. And then we'll give you a couple tactical drills that you can that you can use for improving timing. Now, timing is a part three part. Se uh, series when I talk about the checklist. So we talk about play discipline and how many strikes are we swinging at, what, how many of these ball, how many of these swings were we on time, and then the last one during practice or training, not in games, we're talking about whatever mechanical thing that we're, we're talking about. So it's those in that order, how many strikes we're swinging at, how many swings are on time, and the mechanical thing that we were working on. And that is kind of more the hitting outcome evaluation we'll get into a little bit more a little bit later. But the first thing I wanted to talk about when we're improving timing is that we have to train or practice like we're going to play, so we play like we practice. In a game, you're going to see, or a hitter is going to see, one pitch every 10 to 20 seconds, depending on if we're talking about fast pitch for girls or baseball for boys. We're going to see a pitch every 10 to 20 seconds. So this is why fast fast soft toss or rapid fire soft toss is no good. This is why batting practice, just count how many seconds between pitches. If we're, if we're counting between about five to eight to nine seconds between pitches, that's too fast. It's not giving the hitter enough time to simulate how it's going to be in a game. Now, obviously, we don't want to do this in, in batting practice. We don't want to be taking 15 seconds between batting practice throws because our practices would drag on like forever. But what we can do is we can limit the amount of swings each hitter has so that they have to maximize each swing. They have to really maximize their focus on each swing, have to be aware of what they're doing. Instead of blindly swinging for 10 to 15 swings or repetitions, and what happens is I call the, the marathon swing. So when a hitter or when, when we're doing work, whether it's in the weight room or we're hitting and it entails a lot of work, what our body does is it shuts down and goes about 70% of its one rep max, in other words, like if we're talking about in the weight room. So 12 to 15 reps in the weight room is going to give us endurance, but it's not so much going to give us strength or power or explosiveness. Explosive power has to be low reps, low weight, and move it quickly. So and that's what we're doing when we're hitting when we're throwing. Pretty similar, pretty similar. So when we're hitting, we want to keep our hitters to about three to five reps. And this is something that Colonel Mark Coase talked about in his testimony, which I'll link to in the post below this video. If you're watching this on YouTube, then go to the link below in the About Us section, click the link, that's the full post, and you can go in there and find the link to that article. But I'm just kind of distilling down what Colonel Mark Coase was saying in this, in this video. So three to five swings, max. Don't need any more than that. No less than three because it doesn't give the hitter enough time to make an adjustment. And then really no more than five, no more than seven or so. I, I keep my hitters to five, although I've done three, three to five. I think that gives hitters enough ch uh, chance to make an adjustment, but also remember what they did on each swing. The next point that I wanted to talk about is game time intensity with the swing. Now, I tell my hitters, you swing as hard as you possibly can, wait for it, under complete control. So we're not swinging completely hard where they're falling off balance or taking these swings where bam and they're falling off balance, falling backwards, falling towards the plate, whatever. We're taking swings as hard as we possibly can, but 
under complete control. We want that's why we're we're limiting the amount of reps, the amount of swings that we're doing, three to five swings, so that we can maximize the amount of the amount of intensity with those swings. So we want to make sure we're taking hard swings in practice. And I think this is one of the biggest reasons, besides marathon training and taking 15 swing rounds, I think this is one of the biggest reasons why we it, we have a hard time taking a grooved batting practice swing into the game. Because we're not training for the game. We're not practicing like we're going to play, so we play like we practice. So the other, the other thing that happens when we go full intensity, and this is what Colonel Mark Coase talked about, is it lengthens the lever arm. Now what the heck does that mean? So lengthens lever arm. So if you can just try this for yourself, but it has to do with centripetal and centrifugal force. So if I have a rock attached to a string, right? You have a rock down here. This is the string. I'm holding the string. And I start doing this. Well, this is centripetal force. So the, the rock down here, the weight down here is creating a center seeking force that's coming up here. So it just keeps going in a circle. Now if I were to continue with this and just let my bat go in a direction, the bat will go in a tangent or the end of the bat or the, the center of gravity of the bat will go in a specific direction. Now what's happening there is called centrifugal force or center fleeing. So when we talk about the lever arm being your arms holding the bat, mainly the front arm, if we swing easy I can keep my arms bent because of the length of the lever arm will shorten when I'm taking easy swings or marathon swings. When I swing harder, it's going to cause my arms to extend out a little bit. And I'm not saying to get extended at impact or anything like that. I'm just talking about the force, centrifugal force of center fleeing. It's going to lengthen the lever arm more if you swing hard than if you swing just with maybe 70% or 60% force. So what happens with timing there, that's going to affect timing because if I'm used to taking marathon swings and then I get in a game, and this is what happened with the Coast Brothers, is that they swing as hard as they can in a game, but, but easy swings during practice, and, and they're timing it. That's totally two different timing things. Because for one, if I swing hard, I can, I can swing later. I can decide to swing later. Then if I swing easier, i got to start my swing earlier. Does that make sense? So my timing is off there. So I'm practicing different timing in the cage than I'm practicing in the actual game. And so the both Coast Brothers are popping the ball up a lot to the opposite field, and Dad was wondering what the heck was going on. Dad's got some physics and engineering background behind him. And so so he looked, they looked at film and they found that they were swinging way too hard in the game. So what they did was they took the same swing in the game and they swung as hard as they could during, during their practice sessions. And that's when the change happened. They went from 15 swing rounds to 3 swing rounds and swinging as hard as they can under complete control and it totally changed everything from there on out. So I mentioned the hitting outcome evaluation checklist. So between three to five swing rounds, I ask my hitters questions. I don't tell them exactly what they're doing wrong right away or what they're doing right than what they're doing wrong. I ask them questions. So the first question is, how many strikes did we swing at? This is great for seven, you know, 12 and under hitters because it gives them a sense of the strike zone. You help, and you'll help them out too because a lot of times in the beginning they aren't paying attention to that and they will tell you the wrong answer. So you, you help them out at the end when they, you kind of go through the question, the checklist, and then you help them with, with each question that you asked them. So the next question is, so you go, how many strikes did you swing at? So if they did a five swing round, they can say, ah, three out of five. And then you talk about those two that, that they swung out of the zone. Where were those pitches located? Then you go into how many, how many swings were on time? And with, whenever I go live, well, we're going to talk about one of the tactical drills that we do is, is called the, the varied reaction live toss timing drill where they have two plates. They would have one plate here and then they would have another plate maybe 10, 10 feet behind that one. And they would switch between plates during our session. So if, if in the beginning for my beginner we do five swings of one plate, we, we do our, go through our hitting outcome evaluation checklist. They'd switch again to the, the other plate. We go uh, After those five swings we go through the hitting outcome evaluation checklist. We go back to this plate and on and on and on until they figured it out and they got they were swinging at more pitches in the zone and they were more on time and then what we would do is make this harder and we would have them switch instead of every five and then stop eval we would have them switch every two swings so they go two swings here two swings here two swings here stop so six swings total in that round we do heading evaluation checklist do it again we'd have them start here if they started here before so they go two 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 hitting evaluation checklist. And we keep doing that until they were swinging at more strikes, they were on time more, and 
their mechanics were, were getting better, weren't melting down as much. To make it harder, we would switch every two pitches, five swings total. So no matter if they swung or not, a lot of times I'll waste some pitches to get them to switch to the other one where they don't even get a swing at one plate. So we're messing with their timing there using the varied reaction live toss timing drill. So all my live sessions when I'm throwing batting practice to my kids, that's what we're doing. We're keeping to that three to six rep range, uh, swing range, game intensity swings, making sure they're not letting up on their swings. Even if we go into a random round where I'm throwing in curveballs, my older hitters, curveballs and fastball, mixing it up on them. They're, sw they're making hard swings, good intensity swings with, with balance. The other thing that I wanted to mention was that we want minimal coaching feedback in the middle during that actual swing session. I might say, okay, like next next ball or all right, but try not to give away your cards. Try not to give away your, uh, keep a poker face. Don't be like, oh, dang, you hit that hard. Sometimes I do, but try and keep those comments until the end of the evaluation. You can help them out as you kind of gauge if they're paying attention to their swing, what swings were better than others, what swings they were swinging at more strikes, what swings they were on time, and then working on their mechanics. And then you can kind of go, dude, swing number three was unreal during, you know, during that time. And that's a good praise for them. While also talking about the swings they weren't swinging in the zone or they weren't on time. So minimal coaching feedback between the session, and then let them know it's okay to make mistakes. You're not gonna take a switch to their butt if they make a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes when you're asking them questions, especially the younger hitters, this is good for them to know, because they need to know that this is, there's gonna be a lot of failure in this game, and, that it, and failure is okay, just as long as we're learning from it and we're moving on. We're using it as a feedback mechanism and not so much a, like a, it's, a, it's a detour and not a destination, in other words. So it's okay to make mistakes, especially for those younger hitters, they need to know that. Tactical, I, I mentioned the varied reaction live toss timing drill, and I won't, go over that. I won't go over that again, but the other thing that we can work on with timing is a float and fall, or like Coach Mike, uh, Matt Noakes talks about, is the ride and stride. Basically the same, same thing, different verbiage, whatever you want to use, but it's basically we want to get somewhat of a float, so some hitters have a high leg kick, so you're going to see a higher float like a Jose Batista or Josh Donaldson, so you'll see them actually get up here, before they, and they're timing the pitcher, before they actually fall forward or fall down. Uh, some hitters are more with a slide step or a toe tap. The toe tap, that's basically them floating and then falling forward. So we want to be able to train that by using variants. So what I would do, say, with the toe tap is I would have a hitter work five swing, a five-swing round when we're talking about mechanics, and we would say swings one, three, five, the odd swings, I want you to toe tap. So we would go here, we'd go float, fall. We can break it apart, we can stop there, we can put a swing onto it, however you want to do it, depending on the hitter and what they, gotta, what they have to work on. But then the other thing that we can do on swings two and four is just have them fall forward. So no, no going back, no float, but just have them fall forward and take a swing. Both of those different things are going to require different timing. And we want to have timing baked into the swing. So I like either the float or the fall or the ride and stride, however you want to do it. So in this video we talked about the dead simple guide to optimizing a hitter's timing in games answer the reader question of how to improve my son's timing. We went over the three to five swings or the three to seven swing limit or parameters. We went over game swing intensity and lengthening the lever arm, making sure that we're swinging as hard as we possibly can but under complete control. We talked about the hitting outcome evaluation checklist and going over that in between rounds. We talked about minimal feedback for coaches in the, during the actual session, but at the end when we're asking questions, that's when our feedback is warranted. We talked about that it's okay, make sure our hitters know it's okay to make mistakes, especially our younger hitters. And we talked about two tactical drills that you can do using the float, fall, or the ride and stride. And we talked about the varied reaction live toss timing drill where we use the two plates. Hope you liked the video. Make sure we're swinging smarter by moving better. And before I let you go, the Hitty Performance Lab wants to know, did you know that you may be losing out on eight miles per hour of average bat speed because of one commonly taught hitting technique? Have you ever heard the coaching terms, squish the bug, squish out the cigarette butt? Well, we created a free video revealing the results of a scientific study that will show you how we added an average of eight miles an hour to average bat speed by doing the exact opposite of squishing the bug. Click here now to get the video while it's still free.